Samuel 7 and 1. Then the men of Kirjath Jerem came and took the ark of the Lord. And uh, first off, that's pretty brave. After him, what's all going on? You might think maybe these guys think hey, we better get right because all this damage we're hearing about doing and we're the ones to go take it now. Then the men of Kirjath Jerem came and took the ark of the Lord and brought it into the house of Abinadab on the hill and consecrated Eleazar his son to keep the ark of the Lord. So it was that the ark remained in Kirjath Jerem a long time. It was there 20 years and all the house of Israel lamented after the Lord. And so the ark returned back where God wanted it. He wanted it back with his people. And he got it there without a single Israelite's help. He got it back without any Philistine help. You know what? When I see a story like that, that helps me realize that God is in control. He's going to do what he wants to do irregardless of you. Whether you think you can help or hinder. He's going to do what he wants to do. It's best to know his will and get behind that because he will do it whether you want him to or not. And I had to learn that in my life. Just, just be in God's will. It's a lot easier way to live. So he's in control. And so the people here are sorry. They were sorry for violating God and treating him like he was a good luck charm. Oh, we're losing the battle. Somebody go get the ark. God's power's not here. Somebody go get it. You know, I've worked on radio transmitters for a lot of my life, and radios have a certain distance they can talk to, and then the signal fades out. And it's like you've got a 20-mile radius on the ark. I guess God's power doesn't go any farther than that. Go get the ark. We're losing. Get the signal strong over here. <laughs> Crazy. And they didn't call on him before their battles. They had a wrong perception of who God was and what he could do. And now from the sin of this misperception they had, the false gods gave them this misperception. Uh, thousands of people had died, and not just Israelites died, it's Philistines too. Philistines and Israelites, their own people and their enemy. Now this has been a very tragic outcome. Uh, we're going through some tragic outcomes right now. There's a lot of crazy things going on. Guys, sin always ends up with tragic results. Sin never does anything helpful. The wrath of man never produces the righteousness of God. It just doesn't work. So we have to recognize that and think, well, there's a better way of taking care of our business and that's getting right with God. So it always ends up hurting somebody. And so, yes, they lamented, it says, before the Lord. They're finally starting to get right. Well, my God doesn't want me to get down and cry and whine. He wants me to be happy. No, when you've been sinning and causing a mess, then yes, lamenting is the very thing you should be doing. I am sorry, God. Scripture says godly sorrow brings repentance. That's a good thing. And repentance leads to salvation. That's a better thing. And so they're doing the right thing. They're just now coming to a good position towards getting right with God again. And so the ark was at Kirjath Jerem for 20 years by the time Samuel came into public ministry. Now, as far as we've been looking at Samuel, he's been this little kid priest. Now, 20 years just popped through on the pages, and now he's 20 years older than what he was. And the ark remained there, we know, for 20 years, but the ark in its history stayed at that location for 100. For 100 years, it stayed in that one spot. And then it was taken by David to Jerusalem in his first years as king in about maybe 1,000 B.C. or so. But after these first 20 years of the ark's 100-year stay... Samuel comes along and he puts a challenge in front of the people. And that is in 1 Samuel 7 and 3. In 1 Samuel 7 and 3. Then Samuel spoke to all the house of Israel saying, If you return to the Lord with all your hearts, then put away the foreign gods and the Ashtoreths from among you and prepare your hearts for the Lord and serve him only. You hear that? Wow. Wow. And serve him only, and he will deliver you from the hand of the Philistines. So the children of Israel put away the, ba the Baals and the Ashtoreths and serve the Lord only. Look at this. They're being obedient all of a sudden. Isn't it something how getting pops makes you obedient, right? That's pretty much the deal here. When your kids mess up, you got to spank them, I guess. And so to prove to the Lord that you are fully serving him, you have to get rid of what you formerly served. You can't serve God while you're still serving the other things. 
You've got to get rid of those first. And so what is the word for this action? It starts with an R. Repentance. It's a rated R word. Society hates that word today. I want you to see here what Samuel said. He said, if. Do you see that word? That is a very powerful word. If. That means it's God is orchestrating something that's dependent on your action. That if you confess Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. But there's an if. Because that means some people are not going to do it. But some people are. So he says, if. Uh, if you return to the Lord with all your heart, turn around, repent, and put away the foreign gods and serve him only. That's if, dependent on if, if you do this, then he will deliver you from the hand of the Philistines. This is what's con called a conditional promise. There are unconditional promises that God makes. God makes promises that he's going to do irregardless of what you do. And there are promises God makes that he will do if you respond to it. So this is one of those conditional things. So he said he will deliver you from the hand of the Philistines if you do these things first. Now Israel had just been defeated by the Philistines and now they are seeing where the victory is. Oh, this is where it's at. This is why we lost. We have to give up this and turn from that and serve God only and then we're gonna have victory. That's how it works. They're starting to see the right way to walk. And you know, I find that with a lot of, I found it with myself back in the day too when I got saved, but I find that with people that they're in defeat, 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 defeat all the time. And well, why don't they get out of it? Because somebody needs to show them the alternative. You need to give them the, the direction to go. If you do this, if you turn this way, you got to tell them, you got to show them. Remember, if one guy goes, people will follow, okay? Show them what that is. So here's Samuel to show them. They had just been defeated by the Philistines. That's all they knew. And now they see where the victory is. The victory is in turning back to God. Friends, victory is in turning back to God. It's not by thinking you're so great. It's not by continuing to do the same old thing that hasn't worked yet. <laughs> Which, if it hadn't worked yet, why are you still doing it? Come on. <laughs> it's in turning back to God and getting rid of the things that you have been had, you had your hands locked on. Oh, but I have to do this. If I let go, it's going to get out of control. Hey, it's out of control now. Turn to God. That'll fix it. They cannot serve the Lord while dragging the false gods along with them. So where he said for Israel to get rid of the Baals and the Ashtoreths. Those were shrines to false gods. They got shrines up. I went into the upper room. You know the upper room in the Bible? I went there in Israel. Did you know there is a Muslim shrine in there? In that room. I'm standing in the upper room. Really? This is where the Holy Spirit got poured out? I'm like, what's that? He goes, oh, it's a Muslim shrine. Really? So imagine here, here's the Israelites. We're following God, we're following God. He says, get rid of those shrines. Get them out of here. They had them. So he said, get rid of the Baals, the Ashtoreths, shrines to false gods of the Canaanites. To imagine that the Israelites were worshiping the false gods of the very people that they fought to conquer, to get out of their land. They kicked those people out of the land and, and beat them, and they're worshiping the shrines of their gods? What is wrong with this? <laughs> Americans, you've got money problems, then why do you keep worshiping that shrine? Why do you keep worshiping the dollar bill? It's not helping you. It's your enemy. God is your friend. Turn to him. And so, an Ashtoreth specifically was the goddess of war. That's the goddess of war. Now, uh, you can see that the Israelites had replaced the Lord with a false god that they thought was going to bring them military victories. They had just got beaten. And they're following this Ashtoreth, goddess of war. And so being that Israel had recently suffered a defeat, you can see what Samuel was getting at when he said, put away the Ashtoreths from among you. Notice he said, put away the Ashtoreths, and then he will hand the Philistines over to you. He, he associated military victory in the same sentence as, put away the goddess of war. You see what he just did? Serve God only. And he will deliver you from the Philistines, not the Ashtoreths, not the Canaanite goddess of war or, or god of war. 
Samuel just spoke counterculturally, didn't he? Against the norm. And that's kind of where we are today. We're kind of counterculture. We don't think like everybody else does. We don't do like them. Or at least you're not supposed to. It makes you look different. It makes you look weird. Basically, what Samuel is telling Israel, he's teaching them how to go back to holiness. Holiness means set apart. You're going to look different because you're not standing in the crowd. Get rid of the asterisks. They're not saving you. Turn to God only. He'll do it. Well, we're going to look weird, Samuel. Yeah, I know. That's why God's chosen you. You're supposed to be a holy people. Wow. So, Israel was looking for their victory in the wrong place. You ever look for victory in the wrong place? I used to look for victory in money a long time ago. That wasn't working out very well. Matter of fact, the more I looked for it, the less I had of it. <laughs> and God just like, nope. I told you all that story. Me and Anna, I met Anna at this uh, company we worked at. After five years, the entire company all got a raise across the board. Except me. I was the only guy in the whole company that did not. God had a calling on my life. He had something better for me to do. And he was trying to straighten my mind out. Well, why did Anna get a raise? Well, he, she wasn't worshiping money like I was, <laughs> okay? I had to go through that. So I've been trying to call a lot of um, Americans to repentance. I mean, remember, the, the Israelites are lamenting now because they realize Samuel's trying to set them right. I've tried to call Americans to repentance, but right now they're not lamenting. Americans are not lamenting. I know some of us are in pockets because we're sorry for what we've done, but the world is not lamenting. Right now, they're mad. They're mad at God. They're shaking their fists and they're breaking stuff. We're not going to have this. We don't like this. They're angry. They're not lamenting. It's the majority scale. They don't want to hear it. They don't want to hear about repentance. Don't tell me that. I want what I want. They're still trying to follow their false gods. So Samuel is placed in perfect timing here. He is in perfect timing to speak these things to the people while they are lamenting. Think about it. The people aren't going to hear it when they're not lamenting. Guys, we're going through all this mess right now in our culture, and it's driving people to start lamenting. They're going to start listening to you. And God is going to put you in a place of timing to speak the gospels, to speak the word to people while they're lamenting. And they're going to be out of all other hopes and they're going to listen to you. But you need to tell them. I thank God for what's going on right now. I hate the lockdown as much as anybody, but I'm thankful because people need to lament. They need to be sorry for what they've done against the Lord and they're just not there. Samuel came just right on time. Israel is lamenting. He said, put away these false gods, serve him only, and then he will deliver you from the enemy. And guess what? Israel obeyed and they're starting to do it. Guys, lamenting is a good place to be because it's when you get low before the Lord. First Samuel 7 and 5. And Samuel said, gather all Israel to Mizpah. Gather all Israel to Mizpah and I will pray to the Lord for you. So they gathered together at Mizpah, drew water, and poured it out before the Lord. And they fasted that day and said there, we have sinned against the Lord. There it is. We have sinned against the Lord. And Samuel judged the children of Israel at Mizpah. Now, that's where God's trying to get them to, is to confess. We sinned. God's not trying to get them to fix what they did. He's trying to get them to admit what they did. <laughs> I know you've done things in your life that you can't fix. You've done things in your life that's beyond you, and you can choose to do one of two things. You can let it beat you up for the rest of your life and make you miserable, or you can realize there's nothing I can do about it, but I will confess I did wrong. That's all God wants out of you. He wants you to confess it, and that's what they did. So, the Israelites, they would go to Mizpah. What is Mizpah? They, they go to Mizpah in times of emergency. Mizpah means watch tower or lookout. So you can see that they're merely going to Mizpah was, Lord, we're, we're sorry. We need to start looking for our enemy. We need to start looking at ourselves. It, it's kind of a statement to go there. And so Samuel prayed over them. And offered sacrifice for them as a demonstration of their genuine repentance. 
And it showed, it being at Mishpah, it showed their desire to get under God's protection. Okay, Watchtower was a strong place. They wanted to get under God's protection at, at Mizpah. Now, do you remember, you probably remember what happened when the people of Israel went to battle with the Philistines without their hearts being right before God. They didn't ask him, Lord, how do you want us to do it? And they didn't consult. Their hearts weren't right. They went to war. What happened? Okay, well, now they've gotten right with God. Now they're getting there. They're turning around. Things are coming back. Now, now that they've got right with God, with lamenting and repentance, watch what just happens next. <laughs> it's like timing is, oh, here come the Philistines again. Well, now this is a different Israel. This is going to be good. First Samuel 7 and 7. Now when the Philistines heard that the children of Israel had gathered together at Mizpah, <laughs> like I said, timing, <laughs> The lords of the Philistines went up against Israel, and when the children of Israel heard it, they were afraid of the Philistines. So the children of Israel said to Samuel, Do not cease to cry out to the Lord our God for us, that he may save us from the hand of the Philistines. Okay, he promised that would happen if they turned. Now that's what they're crying for, okay? And I just think it's really something how the Philistines, just, oh, well, let's go get the Israelites right after they made the turn. It's, it's almost like God's going to show them, look, I'm going to prove it to you, okay? Oh, looky here, here come the Philistines. <laughs> you ever done something in, w with the Lord and you, you got right with God and, or you're going to do some ministry work or Hank can tell you because he just did a message the other day. You're going to go do something for God and you're getting your heart right and bam, here comes the enemy. <coughs> I mean, just like that, the timing is just right there. That's how it works, guys. Don't think something weird's happening to you. It's about normal. So, but they're reacting differently now than they did before. They're not reacting the same way they did. Before, it was, the, it was Baal and the Ashtoreths. And if we start to get beaten, then only then will we call for somebody to run and get the ark. Oh, we'll, we'll get the ark if we get beat. And it, but they wouldn't consult with God first. But now they're saying we need to pray first. The Philistines are coming. Now they're wanting to consult with God. This is the way to engage warfare. This is how you engage warfare. You ask God first. They're confronting problems differently. The first thing they do is they ask Samuel, their priest, for prayer. Cry out to the Lord. They're asking the right way. Uh, that he may save us. This is how you do battle, guys. You ask the Lord ahead of time. You be right with God. Really, you should be right with God 24-7 because that enemy is going to try to get you all the time. And he's really going to wait for your guard to be down to strike. He's smart. He knows when to hit you. You've got to be prayed up. You got to be prayed up well. First Samuel 7 and 9. And Samuel took a suckling lamb and offered it as a whole burnt offering to the Lord. Then Samuel cried out to the Lord for Israel. And the Lord answered him. Oh, yeah, we are cooking. <laughs> the Lord answered. You ever got an answer from the Lord and you're like, yeah, that's what I'm talking about, Jack. <laughs> this is the best part of the whole chapter right here at the end of verse 9. The Lord answered him. That makes me excited, guys. Because if he'll answer to Samuel, he'll answer you. Well, he was Samuel. Well, you're you. He loves you too. This is why we should do things God's way. Because when you do it his way, you get results. God answered. Now, I also want to point out that when you do not do things God's way, when you are disobedient and go about your own opinion, God will not help you in that. You'll suffer defeat. Well, I've been around a long time. I, I've been around this earth quite a while. I know what I'm doing. I've got experience. I've been doing this. I've been doing this. I'm, I've been around. I hear that. You see those same guys and they're prideful. You know, I've been doing this. I'm Mr. Know-it-all. Miserable as anything. Your experience doesn't count when it comes to the enemy because the enemy's been around a lot longer than you have. He's been messing with people who lived centuries before you ever did and they're exceedingly good at it. Don't gamble your experience against what the enemy can do. Be under the protection of the Lord. Um, you know, it's, defeat is a good indicator that you've gotten off track with God somewhere. When you experience defeat, let that be a red flag 
that you need to review yourself to see what's off. Anytime you're defeated, I got off somewhere. Red flag moment, alarm goes off. You better pray, Lord, what, what did I do? It's just a good habit to make. But now Israel is doing right. They're inquiring of the Lord first before they do anything. Guys, before you pop an aspirin for a headache, do you pray about it? Before you make a purchase at the store, do you pray about it? Paul said pray about everything. I mean, he meant it. God means it too. Consult with God for everything you do before you do it. 1 Samuel 7.10. Now, as Samuel was offering up the burnt offering, the Philistines drew near to battle against Israel. Look at this, guys. I would be thinking, hey, we need to get ready for war. The Philistines are like right there. They're doing sacrifice work. <laughs> they're, they're not even prepping for war. They're sacrificing. They're honoring God. Remember, he said, if you turn to the Lord and honor him, he will hand you. See what, see what happened? What they're doing? Their actions show their trust in God. I can imagine somebody, Samuel, why don't we do, no, we're doing sacrifice right now, buddy. Remember what I said. He, he'll, he'll take care of it. Okay, yeah. That guy probably would have been me that would have said that. As Samuel was offering up the, the burnt offering, now as Samuel was offering up the burnt offering, the Philistines drew near to battle against Israel. But the Lord thundered with a loud thunder upon the Philistines that day and so confused them that they were overcome before Israel. And the men of Israel went out of Mizpah and pursued the Philistines and drove them back as far as Beth Car. Then Samuel took a stone and set it up between Mizpah and Shen and called its name Ebenezer, saying, Thus far the Lord has helped us. Who confused the Philistines? The Israelites shouting? No, he made it thunder. <laughs> I've had thunder hit pretty close to me before, and it scared me pretty good, but it was just one pop. I imagine God thundering them pretty good. That'll scare anybody, especially when it's close. I don't know if you've been next to a lightning strike before, uh, working at tower sites and stuff. I've been around towers that got hit. When it's that close, it'll, it'll knock you one. It's really something. But the Philistines had about 20 years ago, they had lost a lot of people in a clash with the Israelites. So there's still a lot of hatred going on at this point. There's a lot of grudge still hanging in the air. And so they heard about the Israelites and they went there to fight them. And because they had beaten Israel not long before this, not too long ago, they had a good victory on their record. They thought they could still whoop them. Oh, we did it before. We'll do it again. And they come up to Israel. But this was not the same Israel they encountered last time, was it? Guys, if you're experiencing, experiencing defeat, you've got to be a new person. If you're experiencing defeat, you need to be a new creation of God. You need to be remade into something that you were not before. And Jesus Christ can do that if you'll give them your life. But this was a new Israel. This was a repentant Israel. This is a false God-free Israel. And they are in Israel now that had submitted themselves to the power of the Lord. That is what is different this time. You ever watch Rocky III? I'm looking at you ladies. Of course you have. Rocky III. You know, he... It's the one with Mr. T in it. Mr. T, Mr. T was Clubber, Clubber Lang. Clubber Lang was coming after the, the title. And Rocky was the champion and he had beaten all these guys and he was cocky. And he was arrogant. And he had all this, this fame and, and all the wealth he had. So he stopped training like he should have. And he got a little lazy. He was, in his, he was training. He invited the public to come watch him. Girls wanted to kiss him. Uh, Polly was selling, you know, little trinkets. And Rocky was just, you know, posing for pictures. And a few punches. And then he'd pose a picture again. It, it was ridiculous. It was crazy. And so um, Rocky spends time or wasting time and then Clubber Lang comes and just mops the floor with Rocky's face I mean he just obliterates him in the ring just knocks him clean out and that's not what you're expecting when you see a Rocky movie I remember I went to go see it that was the first Rocky movie I ever saw in the theater I'm ready to see Rocky kill somebody and Rocky the first thing happens he gets beat and like I, as a kid I was 
destroyed. <laughs> well, Rocky spends the rest of the movie getting right. He, he realized he got sloppy. He realized he had to overcome fears. And, and even his former opponent in the previous movie, Apollo Creed, had to come and get rough with Rocky. They whip him back into shape and train him, get him right. And I remember Apollo told him, he said, stop doing this. Stop doing that. Cut it out. At one time, uh, Apollo Creed wanted to give up on him. He says, this man will knock you on your tail. I'm not playing. You need to get right. Take this seriously. Him and Apollo had a real moment there, a real headbutt. And Apollo said, here's what you need to do or else you're going to get beat like you did last time. So Rocky straightened up. He got real. And the next time he and Clubber Lang met in the ring, it was not the same Rocky he fought the time before. It was a different Rocky. Now, I don't want to <clears throat> ruin the movie and tell you who won because I'm sure you don't know and you want to go watch it. <clears throat> <laughs> so I'll save you the spoiler but anyway <coughs> here come the Philistines again oh yeah we got this this is not the same Israel they fought last time at all this is a different Israel the Lord scared them half to death with a loud thunder and it made it easy for Israel to defeat them guys realize that if you'll get right with the Lord your enemy comes up thinking I'm going to whoop you again like I did last time but if you're right with the Lord God, he can thunder that enemy to where it knocks them so bad that your victory is a, is, a, is a cinch. The victory that Jesus Christ gave you. Where's your perception at? Where are you in that? Realize that God could have done this for Israel in the previous battle. The one they got beat at, but he did not. Why did not God not give them that victory? Why didn't he thunder for them last time? Because Israel was not believing in him at that time. They were not right with the Lord. They did not ask God what to do before battle. They didn't pray. They still had their Baals and their Ashtoreths at that time. They weren't really believing God for real. Not for real. Kind of like a lot of people today who say they're a Christian, but not really. If you ask them, oh yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm a Christian. You believe in God? Oh yeah, yeah, I believe in God. But they're, not, they're, they're getting defeated in battle all the time. And God's not with them in it because they have false gods. And so because of this victory, Samuel set up a monument that he called Ebenezer. Which means the stone of God's help. Because he said, God has helped us this far. You know, y'all know that song, Come Thou Fount? That's a popular song, right? And, and in the lyrics they say, here I raise my Ebenezer. You can almost sing here at song. I'm not going to sing it for you. I already sang Sweet Caroline for you today. I'm not doing no more. <laughs> well, here I raise my Ebenezer. So what does that mean? Ebenezer means stone of help. God has helped us this far. And so whenever an Israelite saw that stone, Ebenezer, that one set up by Samuel, they would have a reminder of the Lord's power and protection that it happened here. The stone of help marked the spot where the enemy was defeated and God's promise to bless his repentant people had been honored. The Lord had helped them all the way to Ebenezer. So when Samuel raised up Ebenezer saying, thus far the Lord has helped us. It, when you hear the song where it says, here I raise my Ebenezer. That is a reminder for us that you have to come to a point in your life where you believe in the Lord fully not just pretend halfway like the Israelites did and still got beaten. No, the Israelites had to come to a point where the halfway belief became a full turnaround. A total 100% belief that was so genuine that it is there that the power of God finally came into effect. The real belief point where God's power finally thundered in and got real and produced victory. That is where you raise your Ebenezer. Ray, put up your Ebenezer. Come to the point where you say, I'm finally going to believe in the Lord God for real. And I'm finally going to put my false gods away for real. And I want to live in victory. When it says, here I raise my Ebenezer, it's guys come to a point where you finally make a decision, a decision to get real with God. 
then you can say, come thou fount. <laughs> you can't get the fountain of the Lord God, the Holy Spirit of God, until you raise your Ebenezer, until you get right with him. And evidence that you have is going to be the victory start happening because you really gave yourself genuinely to the Lord. Where the power of God starts to turn defeat into victory. And where victory enters into your life like it had done for the Israelites. They're having victory now. So now whenever you sing, come thou fountain, you say, here I raise my Ebenezer. It's here's the point where I decide I'm going to get right with God and we're going to get real about this. Because I want the victory of the Lord. So, guys, decide to raise your Ebenezer today, a landmark in your life at a time you remember. The man that I spoke to the other day, I said, it's time to come to repentance. I said, let today be a landmark day for you. What Samuel put up was a landmark. It was a stone. It was, they raised their Ebenezer. Guys, let's raise our Ebenezer. Let's get right with the Lord and experience that victory. 1 Samuel 7, 13. So the Philistines were subdued, and they did not come anymore into the territory of Israel. And the hand of the Lord was against the Philistines all the days of Samuel. Then the cities which the Philistines had taken from Israel were restored to Israel, from Ekron to Gath. And Israel recovered its territory from the hands of the Philistines. Also, <laughs> it's like a bonus, <laughs> also there was peace between Israel and the Amorites. Okay, so not only did the Israel get all their territories back, but they also got peace. They got stuff back, and they also got peace. Hmm, let's see, restoration and peace. Restoration and peace, following getting right with God. That sounds like a gospel picture to me, doesn't it? That's the gospel in there. That sure is quite a turnaround from what they had been going on in the past few chapters when everybody was getting sick and dying. Getting sick and dying like crazy, all of a sudden... Everything is being restored and they have peace. The restoration and the peace are not the change though. Hear me. The, the, the restoration and the peace is not the change. Those are the results of a change. Restoration and peace are results of a change. It is a change in itself in one sense. But it's the results of a change. So what was the change? What was the actual change? The change is what Samuel said to them in verse 3. Return to the Lord, put away the foreign gods, prepare your hearts for the Lord and serve him only and he will deliver you. That is the change that was made and so they got to enjoy the results of that change which is in the form of peace and restoration. Isn't that good? It's exciting. First Samuel, <clears throat> goodness, 1 Samuel 7, 15. And Samuel judged Israel all the days of his life. He went from year to year on a circuit to Bethel, Gilgal, and Mizpah and judged Israel in all those places. But he always returned to Ramah for his home was there. There he judged Israel and there he built an altar to the Lord. Okay, so Samuel is still going to be throughout the book, even in the next one, but there's more to learn about him. But one thing we do know is that he spends the rest of his life mm, crazy sinuses one thing we do know is that he spends the rest of his life serving Israel as a judge um, meaning he ruled Israel in its top office that's kind of like what we would say our president of the United States at the time it was called in Israel it's called a judge to call him a judge is like uh, like the president except the rule was a little different Samuel made this circuit he went around Israel and the reason he did that is he went around to judge people's cases that they had with each other. If people had a difference with each other in business or some kind of thing and they wanted to have somebody mediate and get in between them to resolve their matter, you needed a judge to come and, and fix that problem. So Samuel went around the country to resolve their disagreements. And with Samuel's godly standard, Samuel moving around the country doing that, it would ensure that all the cases were weighed in view of God's righteousness. People always have disagreements and they always get into little scuffles with one another. And if you've got a good and godly guy always coming around all the time to fix it, 
Chances are the people are not going to become enemies with each other. They're going to be friends and it's going to be resolved peaceably and better for both parties. You can see how God put Samuel in to do this tour circuit to keep Israel good in his will. I wish we had a government like that that would do that for us <laughs> these days. And so where it says he made a circuit around Israel to judge Israel, that means God had his chosen man going around to make sure Israel stayed in line with his righteous will. Samuel is now serving as a healthy standard to keep the entire nation right before God. He called them to repentance. Now he's doing a circuit, keeping everything nice and well under God's control. I think that's a good move. This is such a good chapter because we can see there is restoration in the Lord. There is restoration and peace in the Lord, but it is dependent on our decision to turn to him. I don't think anybody in here at least can disagree with that, right? Hebrews 12 and 6, and I chose the NASB version of this because it kind of worded it a little better, I think. For those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines and he scourges every son whom he receives. Now, our immediate cultural thinking says, well, this is wrong. <laughs> I mean, because I come to God, he's going to whip me. <laughs> well, scourges means that the Lord punishes. He puts a restraining effect. Discipline. I put a restraining effect on. You want your kids to behave right, don't you? So you put a restraining effect on them <laughs> to make them behave properly. Now, this doesn't mean that God beats up the people he loves. I, I know our, we kind of tend to run that way when we see a passage like this. But it's kind of like when you see a kid that's acting up in a grocery store. You ever, you're trying to shop some kid is just absolutely freaking out. Because probably on, he probably got to the candy aisle or something. And he wants something that he saw. And he's going crazy. Yeah, you know, sometimes I wonder why people even take their kids to the store with them anyway. I don't know. But... Sometimes you have to. But when you see a kid acting up in the grocery store, do you go over and discipline that kid? I don't think I have a shot. Anna's, Anna's, I think Anna's giving it a shot. But, but, you, but do you? No, you don't. Why not? Because that's not your kid. They don't belong to you. It's not yours. It's not your responsibility. But what if your kid acts, acts up in public? Ooh, that's a different story. Now I can do something. Now that's your place to put some kind of a disciplinary action on them to restrain them. That's how it is with the Lord. Those whom he loves, he disciplines. He has to put some kind of a restraint over us to keep us from going crazy in sin. And he scourges, he disciplines every son whom he receives. In other words, when you become one of his children, then he takes up the responsibility for putting the necessary restraint over you that's intended to keep you in line with his will. It's like that child in the story. You're not going to do anything about it because that's not your kid. But what if they became your kid? Now you're going to do something. That's what this verse says. Aren't you glad God looks at us like that? He's going to put a restraint on us from freaking out, going crazy in sin because you're mine, he says. You're not supposed to go like that. You're supposed to act that way. You're supposed to be holy. Now, when Israel turned back to the Lord, he established Samuel to go around every year to keep the people from suing each other into warfare. Can you imagine how cases would get if nobody godly is there to resolve them out? People will kill each other. Pretty much what we see today. For those of you who have walked away from God, much like Israel had done, and you find yourself living in defeat and turmoil, if you want to experience the peace and restoration of the Lord, then you must raise your own Ebenezer. Meaning you've got to come to a point where you finally decide it's time to raise up a memorial, a reminder of something that stands in your life that says, I need to turn and get right with God. It's time to get right with God. The point where you stop serving false gods in your life that have only brought you trouble, by the way. Has money ever really fixed your problems? Well, if I just had more of it, I could fix it. No, the last time you got more of it, it didn't get better. The false gods don't help you. You got to stop serving the false gods and turn to the Lord Jesus Christ who brings you peace and serve him only. And then the Lord will hand your enemies over. The Philistines were subdued, it says. And there was peace between Israel and the Amorites. Repentance 
and being forgiven by God, coming back to God, brings restoration and brings peace. Who here needs to be restored? Who here needs peace? Proverbs 16, 7. When a man's ways please the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. I need that. I got a lot of enemies. I don't want them to be my enemy. I want to be at peace with them. How do you do it? I got to please the Lord. It doesn't say you make your enemies be at peace with you, with you by beating them. When a man's way pleases the Lord, he'll make your enemies be at peace with you. Guys, we serve a God of restoration. Restoration. And I want to concentrate on that word today because we saw Israel mess up, cause a lot of damage, and now they're restored. And here's where I'm going to end with it, okay? If you want restoration, 1 Peter 5.10, But may the God of all grace, who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a little while, perfect, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. Guys, I have an unsettled heart sometimes. I need the Lord to settle me. Acts 3 and 19, repent, first word, repent, repent therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. I want to be refreshed. Guys, there are times even in ministry, I just get tired. We got to stay repentant before the Lord, guys. We have to do that so that times of refreshing may come. And where do they come from? From you? From your money? From your vast experience and all the things that you have accomplished? No, they come from the Lord. But guys, if you're in a, if you're in a pressure pot right now, I'm telling you, times of refreshing are coming. Times of refreshing are coming. Just hang on a little while longer, okay? Just a little while longer. It's so hard, I know. That's why we're here together. Times of refreshing are coming. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the things you've done for us, Lord God. Thank you that you are sending times of refreshment. You are a God of peace and restoration. Lord, we know we have served false gods. We know we have sinned. We have provoked your wrath. And we have suffered for it. But Lord, because we're yours, even while we were pitching a fit, because of that sin candy we wanted and couldn't have it. You came and did something about it. You died for us, first of all, but you also scourge us a bit. You discipline us, and we don't like that. But Lord, we need to, if we could understand that it's for our improvement, that it's for keeping us in line with your will, then we realize there's no better blessing. You do it to help us, not to hurt us. Lord, there's a lot of people, may they understand that your scourging of them is not because you hate them. It's because you love them. And because we are the sinner, not you. And we're the ones out of line, not you. We're the ones that need to come back sinner, not you. And so we learn, we, may we take the scourging as a realization. The Lord is trying to bring me back where I need to be. Lord, I ask that today, uh, some people here or that hear me on the radio. Today be the day they raise their Ebenezer. Today's the day they say, you know what? I've been pretending long enough. It has done me no good. It's time to get real. I'm going to set up this landmark where I finally come to real belief. And that, and that belief includes the removal of the false gods from my life. And I will look to you and serve you only. Whether you take the money away or give me more, I'm not going to consider it mine, nor am I going to consider it lost if you take it away. It's yours. I serve you only, Lord God. I serve you only, and Lord, you will give me victory over my enemies. Thank you, Lord, that you look at us in that way. God, thank you. Thank you. Couldn't sleep at night if I did not know the God that you are, how you are. In Jesus' name, amen.